Hello everyone, The Root of War is finally here and we've been covering it so far on the stream. We had a little sneak peek, so if you haven't checked that out, I will put a little info link above somewhere for you guys in the intro to check out. But we're going to be covering all of the rules today, the buildings, the map, the battle sig, everything you're going to need to know and why this game mode is going to be the best game mode for rewards for the game and for you. So, with all that said, let's go into today's video. Hello, so yes, we're going to be going over Roots of War today. So smash a like, comment and subscribe to the channel for more daily Call of Dragons content with me, an official Call of Dragons content creator. I don't know if it will, but as of checking of this recording, we're only five subs away from 3,000. Insane, you can see the massive smile on my face i can't believe we've hit almost 3k so today we're going to be covering the roots of war so in this i'm going to go over the rules and the battle sync and why this game was going to be good we're even going to go into live draw and showcase the map design even further in a whole segment so i hope you guys are going to go and love that as well because it's going to be a really good in-depth pvp analysis to the map before we even go into you know playing it so with all that said let's go into the ruins right so the rules is pretty simple we have like loads to go through but the ones we're gonna mainly concentrate on is the first gameplay side as well as the overview and the registration right so basically when you are playing this game mode you're gonna have a 30 versus 30 alliance game you have 10 slots that you're gonna have as substitution so in total 40 members can potentially participate right because if 10 of your main team roster don't turn up during the preparation phase basically the subs can jump in right and fill that gap so that's the whole premise of team selection when it comes to the matchmaking, the matchmaking is pretty cool. The matchmaking is determined on your matchmaking rating, which is probably down to how many wins you've had overall, your power, and the number of stuff like on that regards. It also does the number of combatants. So if you've only got 20 players, it should hopefully go against only 20 player alliances. So that'd be nice. And then as well, the number of recent victories. So if you've been on a two, three, five, ten 10 win streak, Hopefully, it's going to place you against other really high talented alliances on similar win streaks. Once I say matchmaking is set up, you're going to be either red team or gold or blue team. I basically say blue and uh, blue and red team, nice and easy to remember that way. And then you're going to have to basically fight for one hour in this region. We have had confirmation from the devs it's going to be one hour of game time, and that's going to be really crucial. When it comes to some of these rulings and what we're going to go over today so the whole premise in one hour whoever has the most points by the end wins you're going to get points from either holding buildings obviously capturing the livestone and then you get personal points for killing right and you need to get kills as well for yourself to get a bunch of rewards so you're going to see those rewards later on so that's the basic premise you know the highest number wins and then you get other rewards so uh don't worry losers if you lose you still get some rewards so that's why it's a really good event honestly winning or losing and participating mainly is where you're gonna get all the best rewards so when we go to the overview now this is the registration on what you need and this is gonna obviously raise a bit of flags i know a lot of people don't like some of this but your alliance must qualify in the top 20 of your server. Obviously, in some servers, this is going to be an issue. So I would say like server 32 is a big prime example and um, because of how many massive alliances there is in there. And a lot of players might not be part of, you know, that familiar of uh, even the dragon family inside there. So because you're not in that top 20, you won't be able to participate in the alliance power um in this ranking event basically because you're not in the minimal requirements but on top of that you need to at least have 10 flags another reason they're doing this is to stop in rise of kingdoms if you don't know in rise of kingdoms there's loads of farm shells that's used and people jump into those shells for all the different teams and then they jump back in right and this is basically to stop that that means you know that alliance if you are going to jump in and do that sort of tactic 
always needs to be in the top 20 worth of power when all those members jump in, right? So as long as there's, you know, it's in the top 20 power and you've got 10 flags, you're gonna be able to register. So um, only the leader and obviously officers can register through the event and obviously pick the teams who's gonna be participating. And after the registration opens, and this is really, this is the bit where everyone here needs to take notes on two, three and four. So after registration opens, players can only take part in Roots of War through their current alliance. You cannot take part in the same round of Roots of War if you move to a new alliance. So if you're registered into a team, you need to participate in that alliance team's uh, Roots of War. Because if you try and join another team, you're not going to be able to participate. And then players who join an alliance after the registration opens cannot join that alliance team. So if you're gonna try and join a certain alliance for their team for this event specifically, you need to join 24 hours before this event is gonna trigger, right? So before reset, make sure you're in that alliance team because as soon as reset triggers and this event's online, that is when registration is open and you will not be able to join that alliance and then join the registration. You've missed the cutout point, right? So that's very key. And you won't receive any teams, uh, any rewards. So that's even worse. So if you join there, now you're late to the party, you're not gonna join any, join the fight and you're not gonna get any rewards. So very important to make sure you're on time before and you're in the right alliance. Once the registration ends, the Alliance team roster will be locked and it cannot be changed. So that is gonna be finalized, right? As I said earlier, you have 30 combatants and you must have, and you can have to have uh, 10 subs. And then as well, you must be at least level 16 in your city hall. This is a basic requirement, either just for the season reset reward. So everyone will have this anyway. So I won't really worry about that. But this is where things are gonna get start to get, I wouldn't say like dicey, but again, this is like where you guys need to pay attention to what's going on. So in order to join the, the new map, you get teleported into in this battlefield, you can't have any of your legions deployed, you can't be in war friends there, and your hospital cannot be filled, right? So you have to make sure you've got nothing in there and you're ready to go basically before you go into this battlefield. Um, any severely wounded you do have are transported to the battlefield and deployed in battle basically. So it's, you'll, it's a long winded way of saying it, but basically um, this hospital that you have won't affect your ability in this mode. And the reason why is when you go into this zone, the healing system is different, which we're gonna go over, but we're gonna just stick to these basic rulings first, and then we're gonna go over um, all the in-depth parts. So as you can see, these are just basic Ark of Osiris things. You know, don't have your legions out, make sure your hospitals aren't filled, relay, and don't be in war friends. It's sim simple, relay. Just be fully prepared to go into fight and fight for your alliance, yeah. So when we go into the start of the battle, though, this is the preparation phase that they were talking about. So you can place all your markers on there, which is really cool, and you have three minutes to prepare. And then if you don't have, obviously, any sort of uh, members in here, this is when you start subbing and getting all the subs in. No one can obviously occupy buildings or deploy legions, but like I said, they can set alliance markers. Once that phase is done after three minutes, you will then enter the building, uh, buildings and open phase, which is phase one. So you are then able to start fighting. You can start basically punching through and capturing the main buildings, which we're gonna go over very shortly in the next couple of tabs. And then once this is done, you're gonna hit maybe phase two, which is gonna start happening between it, and this is when the life stone starts to appear. So you've got three life stone pedestals that you're gonna see in the map and you're gonna have to fight for one. And then at the end of the battle, obviously it says the end phase, the score is calculated, the one who has the highest score wins. Pretty simple, right? Nice and easy. So that is all the rules so far of the game. We've got other rules to go over, don't you worry, which um, we're gonna just go into now because then it, it sums it all up in one section. So. Yeah, obviously this is a nice little roundup of everything. So, you know, you need to be in top 20, 10 flags, make sure you're level 16 in your city hall. Uh, you need to make sure all combatants can march obviously freely when you're in here. So the healing, and this is what is really good. So the way the game mode works for healing is units cannot die in the roots of war, but they can be wounded. And wounded units are sent to a druid hut for healing. There's no limit capacity in your druid hut. 
and the severely wound is can be healed by selecting either elixir healing or resource healing but the way the healing system starts out as and it might show it later on in another section your healing starts at zero so when we go into another um battle area where it starts to limit eyes and everything your elixir healing starts on zero and the reason why it starts on zero is there is a building which we're going to go over that gives you your elixir healing so that is where you get all your free healing and apart from that it's all unlimited resource healing so you can go as hard as you want as long as you've got the resource to do so so that's the way they've set out the healing it's pretty much the same as rise of kingdoms it's resource healing in there but you do have that ability to have free healing in this game mode is going to be the field of view the field of view is basically the fog of war and if you don't know what fog of war is if you've ever played champions of olympia which is again a rise of kingdoms game mode that has fog of war it's when you have the black mist above you and you can't see a certain areas but again this can be changed due to buildings and how far your legions are you're going to share basically the field of view with your alliance members so if that you've got all your alliance members really far out you're going to be able to see what they can see so you don't have to worry about only just seeing what your units can see so uh, Eventually, you're going to see it quite a lot. That's the, the cool thing about this. And I think a lot of people were scared of the field of view. But honestly, guys, don't worry. You're not going to notice this in the game until, obviously, at the start, you'll see it. But then as soon as you go into combat, it'll be like you've, it's not there. So really good way of doing it. And then the cool thing is, and this is the behemoths area now. Behemoths are allowed in Roots of War. You heard me right. Behemoths are allowed in the Roots of War. And the reason why is they're allowed to be summoned three times in total in the Roots of War map. You only can have one Behemoth summoned at a time. And obviously the Beastmaster is the only one who's able to do this. And the Beastmaster will... It says it's like the Beastmaster's camp and all this can be controlled. It's what I've just said, you know. If you've got the Beastmaster's title, you're going to be able to control the Behemoth, right? But this is where strategy is going to start to develop. So if you only can summon three Behemoths and the game mode's one hour long, do you summon two early game, one late game? Do you summon one, one, one? Do you summon one early game, two late game? Do you match your opponent? You know, do you try to do more tempo swing ways of using them? So the strategy when it comes now to Behemoths in Roots of War, I think is going to be insane. So the top alliances with their strategy on point is going to be able to thrive in this game mode. So I do enjoy this and I think this is going to be a really sick moment for anyone like myself who's planning on trying to shoutcast as many of these games as they can. And then when you go to scoring again, this is what we're saying. So when you score, you get score from occupying the buildings, um, killing people from you know the enemy alliance, as well as through the lifestone. So the lifestone appears, you're going to be able to claim it. Once it has been um, delivered to its destination, you see it has a 15 minute timer. So if you pick this up, you have 15 minutes to get it to home. And if you don't get it to home, it's going to disappear. And one minute later, it's going to appear at one of the random now free pedestals. So you need to make sure that you get it on time, basically. And if you do deliver it, um, you're going to get points. Obviously, this is going to go into your save zone. And to deliver it, you just need to put, basically put it into any of the buildings, neutral or alliance. But the cool thing is, if you do drop it at a lumberite pool... An alliance member can pick it up so you can actually swap out you know maybe you get it to there someone picks it up and gets it away you know from that zone so a really cool feature that you can almost pass the parcel in the area so again these are just main things that you can imagine when you're in the game mode you can't be accepting alliance gifts change your name hero artifacts blah 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 you can you know all this right so when you're inside the game mode you're inside the game mode and then this is the scoring. So now this is the little scoring system before we move on to the buildings and rewards. And that'll be all the rulings and boring bit out of the way. So thank you for watching it so far if you've been enjoying it. But the lifestone gives you 3k points, boys. For your alliance, 3k points is insane. And the cool thing with the lifestone, which I kind of missed out, which I do apologize if you read this, each successive one, 
you get increases the next successful like points. So each time you get this 3k, it's gonna go like 3k, maybe 4,500 next time, 6,000 the next time. So it's gonna be quite insane depending on how this works. Obviously you get individual scoring too, which is really cool. But then you've got all your different buildings. So your big boys, your halls, first occupations give you 750 points and then 150 um, score to the Alliance every minute. But for you guys, this is what's important. It gives you 15 score per minute while inside. So make sure if you can, try and be able to help garrison this building or any of these trees. These trees also give you eight score per minute and give you 40 for that first occupation. Your lines gets a nice bit of buffs too, which is really cool. But it's the fact that this combination is gonna give you a load of points all the time and that's what you're going to be needing to do while you're fighting as well right and then a cool thing is which we're going to go over the guard towers they give you a small amount of score which is nice to, so if you're going to try and round it up if maybe if you run out of troops almost this might be the best thing to do just dump them into these buildings and finish out trying to gather up all of those scores also what you can do is get a load of points from gathering. So you can gather different tiles, you've got level one, two, and three, and you've got 33, 49, 66. And for yourself though, you get 150, 225, and 300 score per tile you farm, which is really sick. When you're going for kills, attacking is 10,000 power equals 40, right? So defending 10,000 power equals 80. So basically if you're killing someone, every 10,000 power they lose in combat in that battle report, you're gonna get, eight, divide that number by 80, that's how many points you get. And then for in the field or attacking, you're gonna get 40 points. So basically if you're on the offensive, it's split in half because you're able to do more of it. But if you are just defending as much as you can, you get 80 points. So it's an insane amount of points to get. So my tactic, and I'm already going to tell you guys what I would do is try and get at least two marchers in a building defending. So if they do defend and get some positive trades, you're going to get a lot of merits plus passive score. And then have three marchers out probably trying to fight and get a lot of kills in that regard. So that is all the points, you know, I'll leave it kind of there so you can if you want to take notes guys take notes of it right now i'm going to upload some screenshots of this to the discord soon enough anyway but that is all the rules so far of the game that's everything you're going to need to know basically how to register play the game but now we're going to go and switch into the fun zone right we're going to go and check out the map and then I'm going to explain my theories and stuff, what you can do, and then we'll go over the reward. So I hope you've enjoyed today's video so far on the roots of war. I hope this, this has been a, a nice in-depth video for you guys to learn from without having to go and worry about yourself and try and figure it out, right? So I hope you've enjoyed it. So let's go on and talk about the map, which is honestly the most exciting part about this. So let's move on to the buildings and the map. So here we are, we're at the map. And honestly, this map is lit. So what we're gonna be able to do as well is basically go across some of the buildings and then I'm gonna use a live draw and discuss some things about it. So as you can see, there's the live stones are in three areas. So because they're in three different areas, it basically creates three different zones to fight in. So if you're in the Yen area, you're basically gonna fight along this route here, basically, into here. And this is your way of fighting into that zone. Obviously you can push even further, but then you also then get another path from here into the middle. So now you fight onto the center map here. And then we get a third one. And the third one, I'm gonna change a lot of the color to pink, unfortunately. This one comes all the way there. So you got three different lanes to fight from. If you're an infantry or cavalry, like ground based unit, right? If you're looking at it from the other side now, Lucia has pretty much the opposite. So they go around this way and then they also have the 
ability then to come off here into the center. So you can see they're allowed to a two pronged attack that side while these guys have to do the unfortunate and go around all the way into here. But again, they can technically fight through into it like this, right? But it's still one side. It's one version of a fight compared to the red side that has a two lane advantage, right? So you got two and one, and then on the other side it's flipped. So you got two and then the one over there. So really cool map design on the live stones. And this is gonna be important because again, these are gonna spawn through the map. And because they're gonna spawn through the map, what that's gonna basically entail is, you know, maybe the middle one spawns and now everyone's gonna be rushing, you know, into the center through these pathways, right? And this is gonna be cool because when you go into the gameplay videos that we've seen so far, you're gonna be able to use flying units on these planes. So the way I'm gonna try and explain this game mode is obviously, as you can imagine, it's got different elevations right on this map. So you've got different planes, basically. So you've got plane one and plane two, basically. Plane two is what you start on. So when you're on any of these areas up on the top zone right now, you have to drop down this ramp and that is gonna drop you from plane two into plane one. And if you're in plane one, that's gonna be where you're gonna be able to use your flying units effectively. So stuff like this little feature here, a flying unit will be able to fly over while the ground units will have to move around it, right? Similar with these bridges, a ground unit will have to go over the bridge, but flying units can go across these, um, these terrains. They can actually go across. We've seen it in fights. Also in the center, which is really cool, obviously the ground units have to enter through these two bridges, but the flying units are able to still come across either of these flanks to the next to the bridge here. But what's really cool is all of this back zone here that I'm highlighting in this pink, or oh, should I say blue color, you're able to fly in. And this is a really big zone when you actually see it in the game. So you're gonna be able to fly into any of these crevices and actually take advantage of the flying unit. So really good map design because of the way the life stones are displayed. And that's why they get to spawn where they do. And if you miss out the opportunity, the randomness on it now it creates a little bit of chaos. And honestly, it could change the outcome of any fight. So really good to see. The holes here are the ones which obviously give you the big boy points. They give you the largest amount. So these are located on the far edges as well as the closest to the center. So you can see these are very, hopefully, high contested zones as well. When you go to the next one, the Tree of Courage here, you've got two Trees of Courage. These guys give you attack and defense. So these are boost all your troops units, which is really good. And then you have the Tree of Healing. And this is the one we was talking about earlier. So this is gonna increase the HP of all your units, but also it's gonna increase the elixir, uh, elixir, the elixir production speed and that's going to give you free healing so very important building to take advantage of and again depending on how this game mode plays out different tactics could come out right you might and this is what i'm going to talk about soon because i'm trying to hold it in but there's so many tactics with this that is going to be so interesting to see you have outposts these outposts basically affect the fog of war so you can imagine if all of your units are dead or if all of your units are home, all you're gonna be able to see is this zone, right? Because anything out here is blacked out because of the fog of war. But if you capture these buildings, it's gonna allow you to basically see more, you know? It's pretty simple, you're gonna be able to see more. So you're gonna have less, obviously, field of view um, to worry about. But again, you gotta remember the field of view mechanic works as if we've got units dotted around all these red dots here, so you can imagine all these red dots on the battlefield are legions, your field of view actually extends. So you can actually see all of this area. So you can actually see all of it. You don't have to worry about it, right? Because there's a, your allied units 
are there. So that's why the, the fog of war system is a really cool system of how it works, especially with these outposts too. And then as you won't be able to see on here, this is just the pools. This is what they're gonna look like on screen. A little cool little pool. But if you farm these, these are what they're gonna give you your resource um, rewards. So that is all the buildings in the game. You can see again down here all the benefits of gaining these type of buildings that you can check out for yourself if you really want to. But now let's go into this map because I love this map. This map's so goddamn good because as you can see, as I was saying earlier, the way of the tree of the healings were obviously they're on um, here and here, right? And because they're here and here, what could happen is in certain scenarios you might ignore this middle lifestone and you actually might sacrifice this lifestone, which sounds crazy. But if you can imagine if you're someone like on the Yane side, you naturally gain control of this tree of life. So what allows you to do then is go down and capture your attack buff tree, which is really good. But then you're gonna be able to fight towards this life stone. And obviously you're gonna be pushing towards this life stone. So you're fighting on two fronts still, but you're fighting on the left and right flanks purposely. And by doing this, it opens the opportunity to capture these two main buildings, which give you the most points passively for your alliance, right? Which is really good to do. You also have a fight for the control of these two different life stones, which is really interesting to have as well. But what sometimes might be available to happen is if you do have control of this zone, you can imagine the red team controls up to where this red line is now. And by having it on that red line, they might be able to rally from their base and do a long rally, you know, from this flag all the way along up and then take control of this from the Lucia forces, right? And this might create a massive, insane tension where Lucia now has to physically respond to this attack, right? Because if they don't do this, they're gonna lose out on so much free healing that they needed to keep progressing the fight. Because again, you have unlimited healing in here, so you can do as much resource healing as you want. But if you can get free healing to supplement a lot of those units, like the flying units that are really expensive, oh my god, it's going to be amazing, as you can tell. I'm already excited to see where these things go. Again, just to highlight it, if you're a flying unit, you're able to fly across into these different zones really easy. Again, you're able to fly around this bridge here into these zones really easy. So the, the way this game is going to work is all about you guys, honestly. The, all, the more creative you are with the artifacts that are in the game, the, the, the strategy of the units you have at your disposal and your alliance members, it's going to shine in this game mode. And someone like me, as you can tell, is passionate and loves PvP and this game is gonna be able to take full advantage of that and shout cast it for you, which is my aim of the game for you guys to do. So if you've enjoyed it so far, that is a map breakdown. So far, but I'm willing to give you without spoiling too much of it and giving you too many tips and secret advices of the map. But as you can see, it's a really good map. It's got different elevations. It's got everything you want on a PvP field because then you're gonna be able to take this and transition it to the open field in your season, right? So it's a really good game mode, I can't wait for it. So let's go into the reward to final off this area. So the Alliance rewards, these are basically rewards for every Alliance member, no matter what. If your Alliance wins, everyone gets 200 gems, two stars, some resources, and a bunch of Alliance tokens. If you lose though, it's cut basically in half, right? You get 10 instead of 15. But it's basically cut in half, you lose out in half. But if you are part of the registration team, so if you're part of the main team now, all team members of the winning alliance also receive two silver keys, a bunch of, uh, well, one speed up, a bunch of uh, resources. And the losing team only gets one key, um, half an hour, and five of their choices. So these rewards aren't great, I'm gonna lie. Honestly, if a dev's watching this, 
I would love for you guys to just switch this to a gold key. Just There's too many silver keys in the game. Everyone in the comments will probably agree with this statement. There's so many silver keys and a lot less gold keys. And this would be a really good way of just rewarding those players that participate in their team with two gold keys for the winners and just one gold key for the loser. Keep everything the same, but that'd be something really good. But <laughs> this is where it gets really good. So anyone who is also fighting in this event, this is where all of your score goes towards. And this is why it's very important. So your player rewards, this is your rewards personally. So your individual score from doing all of your fighting. If you're on the winning team and you have over 10,000 and one point, you're going to get 1k gems, which is okay. But more importantly, you get 10 generational 2 tokens which is amazing this allows you to upgrade any of the new generation 2 ca uh, commanders as well as any of the generation 1 commanders from burning stars so it's really good for you to do right you also gain 10k legion reserves allowing you to upgrade 10k troops you also get 25 hours which is basically one day and one hour of speed ups which is really cool and a bunch of resources if you still get between 6k and 10,000, so if you just miss that one point margin, you're going to get 8 sculptures still, 500 gems, and still rewards are great. And even if you somehow do no, nothing, and maybe it's a very boring fight, you're still going to get 5, 2, 15, and 5. So honestly, these rewards are amazing. These are what you get in Ark of Osiris in the Rides of Kingdoms game. And this is a really good way to power your account. So this is why this event is a must do event for you guys to do. And then if you're basically losing, obviously there's losers, there has to be a winner, there has to be a loser. But if you're a loser, the rewards aren't even bad. Look, if you still get 10K and one point, you still get the same rewards as basically at the lowest guy here. So you're gaining the five plus an extra bit of reserves and a little bit less on your resource and speed ups, but that's fine, right? The heads is what's more important. Five heads is amazing. And then you also get four heads if you get between 6K and 10,000. So only losing one head, which is nuts compared to the jump of three here and then the jump of two, right? So you lose one. And then again, you only lose one head if you're in the very bottom bracket. So really good structure for losers really good structure for winners as well the reward structure is really good in this game now and obviously there's going to be more events coming right we've got the celestial battlefield or battlegrounds coming so we don't even know what those rewards are going to be look like but this is what we've been waiting on you know rewards so we can actually upgrade our heroes and level them up nicely as a free to play or low spender as well as obviously the big boys who are going to hit these rewards but it's a really good direction for the game right so that is going to be it guys on all the rules and the map and stuff the last bit i'm going to cover right now of the video is the battle sync i know it's a long video but there's so much to cover in this and that's why it's going to be the ultimate guide for roots of war to start out of until we play you know some gameplay and get some footage for the battlefield so with all that said if you've enjoyed it and you hit it so far Smash a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And with that, let's move on to the Battle Sync feature. So the Battle Sync feature is a really cool feature. You just click on the top right corner of the screen and it comes out. But it equalizes the game. So in this game mode, the way it works is all your heroes will be max level. So you will be max level at 60, meaning all of your stars and investments you've got on those heroes are all good to go. With this, I mean, this is the cool thing. With your heroes is your talents. So if we go on and our, any of our talents right now, and this is only in the Roots of War game mode here, you can click on your talent page and instead you're going to have five abilities, right? So you can make two of your own talent trees here that you would like and you can select these and use it obviously import your own ones um, as well as use theirs you know they've got their own selection so you can have a mobility tree here there's a peacekeeping tree for some reason but there's the marksman tree too 
So this is the same for like Nico. If you go to Nico, he's got a marksman tree here. He's also got a precision tree set up here with the caged animal for raiding, but I wouldn't use that in the battlefield. But then you got Lilia with a, a, a crazy RNG build and then the skill damage build here, but with less um damage more emphasis as you can see this is all emphasis on skill damage here so you can go to these builds and basically select them and allow you to have these talent builds ready for combat which is really cool honestly i love i love the fact that you're able to do that so you can set up what you want set up five talent pages and then good to go and switch between them and then the cool thing is when we go to the artifacts the artifacts are the same so all your artifacts are going to be level 60. You're going to have whatever investments you have. So if you've got a six star or five star, four star artifacts, they're going to stay the same. So it's all about your investments as well as the skills you've got. They're not going to be maxed out for you. So that is where the difference in the player is going to be, as well as obviously your um, skills you've got in your heroes. All of your investments is different. And the policies, and this is what we were talking about earlier, kind of, policies aren't included in here, but naturally the game gives you the most amount of troop capacity that it gives, so you don't have to worry about it, so you're all good to go on that end. And then the healing, as I said earlier, the healing at the start is zero when you're in the elixir healing stage, but you get this through the building. Remember, the tree of healing building is going to give you this, so that's why you need to take capture of it. But the resource is healing is unlimited so again you can go ham if you've got a bunch of resources to go here's your time to shine right and then the last thing to cover in the battle sync area is actually the buffs because the buffs is really good i'm going to leave it on screen for you guys to read and um, because the ones you need to obviously take effect on is your tech your vip and your faction all of those buffs all count if you're in a officer role and you have an alliance title, so the War Master, Beast Master, those um, buffs also apply. And any buildings, and if you're wondering what that means with the buildings, I can quickly show you. If you go to any of your buildings here, for example, and go to your barracks, you can see you get an overall attack bonus, right? So these give you overall attack. So if you have a 25 one, you're going to get 2% bonus attack. And then even your Shaman Huts, if you go to Shaman Huts, and go to the information tab. They also give you 0.5% overall HP. So if you've got level 25 buildings, those all are gonna be able to give you buffs and you're gonna keep all of those buffs in the battlefield for yourselves, right? So just remember that when we're going into it. Also any items, so if you've got an attack boost item, you can use that, but the things you can't use is any village buffs, any alliance tech doesn't count, and any runes and the reason runes don't count is you can imagine if you're in the late game and you can get a flame dragon and you can get that tier five six rune and you're against a player or an alliance that's equally as strong as you but earlier on and then you can get a tier three or four rune it don't really make sense right so runes are inactive you can't get them right so that's fair enough so i hope you guys are looking forward to it i'm looking forward to it i'm gonna be able to make a bunch of builds and obviously select them apply a manual talent presets and empty this preset obviously by default you can then do that select it create it um so really good can't wait for all of these builds to come online and then basically use them in the game mode right because as they said, you're going to be able and you should be able to switch between these different talent pages on the fly when you're inside the game mode only. So it's going to be really good to see how it works. But that's going to be my video on the Roots of War. We've covered everything, the battle sync, the rules, the map, and obviously giving my cool thoughts on the map. Um, if you're wondering on my advice on pairings as a little hot take at the end, you're going to be wanting to bring, obviously, your most favoured ones. I would try and recommend using one Cav March, one Infantry March, and a Range March. And if you're going to try and do it, a second Range March. And then your fifth one should be somewhere garrisoned. But if you're not doing that, then maybe one Cav March and two Range Marches. That would be really good too. So it's going to be up to you guys how we're going to configure this. But again, I would bring your best heroes. I'm going to be probably bringing stuff like my Lilia and Valen. Then stuff like the Nico and Kanara. Or even Hosk. I might try the Hosk and Nico combo. 
And then we've got Fregar. We're going to be running Fregar and Craig. So we've got all of our main matchups set up. So all ready to go for me. I can't wait. I can hopefully you guys are as excited as I am for Roots of War. I've got the biggest smile on my face always. And I mention this because I can't wait for this PvP. And to see some of your guys' clips. So if you guys have got roots of war and you're willing to record your guys footage and you fighting honestly if you're able to do that then maybe in my discord i'm going to create a new zone for you you can post your google you know shared links in like your google drives and i'm going to be able to click on all of your footage and make some really good pvp roots of war shoutcasting esports commentary on the fight so i hope you guys enjoyed the video that is going to be it for today this is the big video of the day roots of war is finally here and if you stayed all the way to the end smash like comment and subscribe to the channel i am mr sneaking official call dragons content creator for the game and to give you guys a little teaser for a later video today i am going to be talking about the gold crest the brand new artifact for the uh, archer march so very hot take insane artifact be prepared because that is gonna be a really good video so with all that said see you guys later stay safe stay sneaky peace out